Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much for being here. Today I will be sharing with you the eight books that made quite the impact in my life. Before we begin, let me quickly tell you how I came about making this list. So firstly, these books are not all universally agreed upon as the books that will change your life. Also, they are not all critically acclaimed. This is just down to personal preference. And yeah, these books are just books that have profoundly affected me in some way over the course of my life. So this video will be a little walk down memory lane for me and it will remind me how magical and powerful reading can be. So let's start. Number one, A Little Princess by Frances Hodgson Burnett. This is not the original copy, but this is the only one I have, so let's just roll with it. A Little Princess tells the story of a young, intelligent, kind, and compassionate girl named Sarah Crew, whose indulgent and doting father dies as she's attending this boarding school in England called Miss Minchin's Select Seminary for Young Ladies. The story follows Sarah's life taking a full 180 once her father passes away from having a private room and a maid in the boarding school to then being belittled, demeaned, abused, and forced to work as a servant. This story is a classic children's tale that shows you what inner strength, perseverance, and resourcefulness looks like. It's all about how we can use our strengths and powers to help others rather than to use them for destruction and abuse. This book is on my list because I remember being so taken aback that I was crying from reading. I distinctly remember how it all happened. I was about three quarters in the book. I was sitting at the edge of my bed. It was nighttime. I was probably like six or seven years old. I just felt tears streaming down my face. And I kind of felt embarrassed by it. Like I was shocked that I was crying. I mean, I guess growing up, I didn't see a lot of people showing their emotions so fully or wearing their heart on their sleeve. So I was kind of like, oh, should I be crying? This book made me realize like the power of words and the power of story and character conflict and being so invested in the protagonist's journey. This book really did show me how a story can bring forth a plethora of emotions within the reader. My favorite quote, Everything's a story. You are a story. I am a story. Number two, The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett. Yep, another Frances Hodgson Burnett book has made it to the list. I don't know how, but I guess her stories were really powerful to me as a kid. The Secret Garden tells a story of a neglected, demanding, self-centered 10-year-old girl named Mary Lennox, who after her parents dying and her servants abandoning her in India, she is then sent to live with her uncle in Misselthwaite Manor in England. There in the manor is a secret garden that she must not enter. The story is a true coming of age tale. It's all about rejuvenation, metamorphosis, uh, emotional and physical healing. It also really shows how children and everyone in general really needs love, attention, connection, time, space, and air to breathe, to bloom, and to grow. This book is on my list because it was the first book that introduced me to the world of literary analysis. I learned how to dissect a book. I got to analyze its themes, its motifs, its characters, its syntax, its diction, and every other English literature term you know. I read this when I was about nine or 10, I think, and my English tutor in Hong Kong at the time said that we would read it together, and I'm so glad we did. I remember realizing the power of literature, like not just how words strung together could paint such a vivid picture, but more so that these words could hold so many layers and complexities. I also remember being really shocked that a protagonist was initially so annoying and dislikable because not many children's stories feature such an arrogant and self-centered protagonist that you kind of don't want to root for. And lastly, the secret garden in the book really did open me up to just how I guess whimsical and magical gardens can be, I don't know. Every time I'm in nature, I think about the secret garden and the beauty that nature holds. My favorite quote, where you tend a rose, my lad, a thistle cannot grow. Number three, The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger. 
This book tells the story of a 16-year-old boy named Holden Caulfield who leaves his prep school in Pennsylvania to travel to New York City and wander around for a few days. This book is known as like the book of teenage angst and rebellion. It covers themes of angst, obviously, um, alienation, coming of age, the death of innocence, grief, change, isolation, connection or lack thereof, sex, depression, and the breakdown of identity and belonging. It's also quite the critique on superficiality, or shall I say phoniness in society. Oh God, where do I begin? Um, I know this is like a love it or hate it kind of book. I personally love it. And this will always hold a special place in my heart. I read it when I was 13 in English literature class. I remember a lot of my friends not liking the book at all because I guess to them Holden came off as bratty and self-centered and just really neurotic. But for me, he just spoke to me so deeply. Like I achingly identified with Holden. Not to ramble into personal hardships or anything, but at the time that I was reading this, I was going through a really dark phase in my life. I was really sad, depressed and anxious and my moods were just like all over the place and I was really insecure and lonely and I totally felt how Holden felt, how he and I both longed for emotional commitment and stability, how he and I longed to not live the life we were both living. Like Holden, I also knew what it meant to be sensitive, to feel a lot, to have such a deep capacity to feel and to love and not know where to channel it in a healthy way. I also love this book because it perfectly captures the time in your adolescence when you are on the cusp of adulthood and how confusing and frightening that feeling is. Like part of you is afraid of losing your childhood. You're afraid of losing that sense of freedom and lack of responsibility and innocence. And yet you're also afraid of what it means to grow up what it means to be an adult, what it means to carry the weight of responsibilities on your shoulders. And in that time of adolescence, everything is fleeting and changing and transient. And you can't quite know how to stay anchored and you're just feeling a lot. And all these feelings are so deep and heavy and it kind of feels like you're having an emotional apocalypse all the time. Lastly, what I love about this book is there's a scene towards the end, like on page 178 to be exact in this edition, where it perfectly describes how I felt when I was in one of the most darkest places in my life. But yeah, I'll leave it at that. That's another story for another time. Favorite quote. I don't exactly know what I mean by that, but I mean it. Number four, Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy. The story centers on our titular character, Anna Karenina. She is the wife of a senior statesman who is 20 years her senior, by the way, and her extramarital affair with a dashing cavalry officer named Count Alexei Vronsky. And I gotta say, the name Count Alexei Vronsky is pretty sexy. Their affair ends up scandalizing the social circles of St. Petersburg, which further unravels their lives and the lives around them. This book covers themes of love, lust, betrayal, faith, family, duties in family, duties in marriage, duties to society. It talks about aristocracy and imperial Russian society in general, and also the differences between rural living and urban living. This book is one of the greatest books ever written. It's also quite the monster of a book, as you can tell by how thick this book is. I read Anna Karenina when I was on the cusp of climbing out of the super low point in my life that I just mentioned earlier. And I read it when I was like 14, no, 14 or 15, something like that. It was the summer I turned 15, I believe. And for some reason, I don't know what, it awakened something in me. It just gave me that big push to say yes to life and to just feel rejuvenated and replenished and just to make the most of my life. This book made me remember a Robin Williams quote from Dead Poet Society, which goes, poetry, beauty, romance, love, these are what we stay alive for. 
I don't really know what to say about this book other than I love it so much. It meant a lot when I first read it and it's incredibly well written. Um, even though Anna Karenina's story only takes up half of the entire story because there's a totally different plot going on, but Anna's journey is what gives the book its name. I mean, it has everything you could want in a book. There's love, lust, betrayal, lots of drama. It's about imperial Russian aristocracy and it's got deaths on a train. What more could you ask for? Anyways, whenever I think about this book, it just reminds me of the paradigm shift I had happen within me when I first read it the summer I turned 15. Favorite quote. You know that I have to come to be where you are. I can't help it. Number five, The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. This is my one and only nonfiction book on this list. So I guess the book is pretty self-explanatory as the title says, The Power of Now is about the power of now. This book is all about how living in the present and just being aware of the now, this moment right here, right now, is the truest and purest form to happiness and enlightenment. The power of now teaches you detachment, awareness. It teaches you the importance of space, like space between words. It can teach you how we can be more conscious of our emotions and thoughts in order to live a more peaceful and meaningful existence. This book came into my life when I needed some guidance on my spiritual journey. At the time, I was going through another rut in my life. It was really tough on my mental health and I was just confused and lost and frustrated and really, really unhappy. And I was hurting a lot. And luckily this book came into my hands and it guided me through the roller coaster of emotions I was feeling. This book gave me the strength to be aware of my thoughts and feelings and not to consistently identify myself with them and to not always react to everything. Sometimes you can be the observer instead of always feeling through everything and getting so attached to those feelings. This also teaches you that you don't have to cling on to the past or obsess over the future because those two things are not happening right now and that all we really have is right now and there is freedom in the now. I think I read this when I was 19 and it had a profound effect on me. I also read The Alchemist, The Doors of Perception, Why Buddhism is Right, and a bunch of other Buddhist scriptures. Also, I gotta say this book has been the book that has brought so many random, but very much invited and welcomed meaningful encounters with strangers in public places. Like I'd be on a train or a bus and someone would come up to me and be like, I love that book or that book changed my life. Or they would just sit down and open their heart to me and just tell me about their spiritual journey, their awakening and what big takeaways they got from this book and how it created such a positive impact on their life. And I just found that so beautiful that I got to have all these wonderful magical encounters with people I would not have talked to otherwise. And yeah, it was so weird. Like every time I held onto this book in a public area, someone would come up to me and be like, I love this book. Oh my gosh, you're reading this? What do you think of it? And it just raised my vibration and just made me feel so good wherever I went because this book just brought people together and we had such beautiful, transformative conversations together. My favorite quote, the past gives you an identity and the future holds the promise of salvation, of fulfillment in whatever form, both are illusions. Number six, The Wind Up Bird Chronicle by Haruki Murakami. This book is my favorite Murakami novel of I think all time so far out of all that I've read from his work. I love this book. The story is about a young man named Okada Toru who goes searching for his wife's missing cat. Soon he finds himself searching for his wife and then he encounters people from different walks of life. A psychic prostitute, a Machiavellian politician, a morbid 16 year old girl and an aging war veteran. In true Murakami fashion, this book is a surrealist, prophetic, poetic and imaginative novel that's like part detective story, part account of a disintegrating marriage and also partially an excavation of the buried secrets in World War II. 
This book is on my list because it is absolutely everything that I could want in a book, really. Like when I first read this book, I was like, dang it. I wanted to write this kind of book. I wanted to be the kind of writer that Murakami is. I want to be one of those characters that lives in a Murakami novel. I want to be one of those cool girls. I don't know. You might not even like his work, but I'm a huge fan. I just love it when there's so much going on beneath the surface that you don't know how it's all gonna unfold. And I love how everybody's tied together. There's like this invisible string that ties everyone's fates together somehow, some way. And oh, I love that stuff. And I also love how Murakami's novels always have open endings. You never quite know what really happened in the end. And I love that. I don't like it when endings are all tied neatly with a bow and I don't like it when everything is answered for you. I like it when the author makes the reader think and makes the reader come to their own conclusions. And it can be unsettling and disorienting, but like, I love that feeling. My favorite quote, the point is not to resist the flow. You go up when you're supposed to go up and down when you're supposed to go down. When you're supposed to go up, find the highest tower and climb to the top. When you're supposed to go down, find the deepest well and go down to the bottom. When there's no flow, stay still. If you resist the flow, everything dries up. If everything dries up, the world is darkness. Number seven. No Longer Human by Osamu Dazai. This story is about a young man who finds himself caught in between the disintegration of the traditions in Japanese aristocratic families and the impact on Western ideals post-World War II. He leaves three notebooks and three photographs to accompany those said notebooks, which detail his thoughts and feelings on how he believes he is disqualified from being human. When I first read this book, I felt like Desai held up a proverbial mirror to my face and made me look at every single dark part of myself, every part that I am ashamed of, that I don't like. He made me see nothing but every blemish, wound, crack, failure, and disfigurement. This book details every single dark thought I've had that I keep locked in the corner of my mind that would probably not be socially acceptable for me to just voice it out to everyone in public. This is that book. It's one of the darkest nihilistic existentialist kind of books you could ever read. And even though this book is called No Longer Human, my god this book is so so human i enjoyed this book because i empathized with the protagonist so deeply i too have had those thoughts and feelings that go beyond self-loathing that go beyond self-hatred this book is just agonizing it's dark it's bleak it's depressing it's painful it drains the life out of you but it's so damn good it's so honest and truthful and it says it how it is and how it should be said and it doesn't beat around the bush or sugarcoat any of these feelings. It's raw and so impactful. My favorite quote, now I have neither happiness nor unhappiness. Everything passes. That is the one and only thing that I have thought resembled a truth in the society of human beings where I have dwelled up to now as in a burning hell. Another quote that I really love is, for someone like myself in whom the ability to trust others is so cracked and broken that I am wretchedly timid and am forever trying to read the expression on people's faces. Number eight, Oyasumi Pun Pun by Asano Inio. This one I read digitally, so I don't have a hard copy to show you, but I will be putting up screenshots of the manga panels so you get an idea of what I'm talking about. This manga is about a young boy named Pun Pun. It's a coming of age tale that tells the story of how his innocence has reached its end after his father is arrested for spousal abuse and his mother is sent to the hospital. He then faces growing pains of growing up, which for better or for worse, changes him forever as he enters into adulthood. I talked about this manga in my current favorites video, which you can check out right here, as well as in the description box below. I'll have a link in there. And so I won't go into a lot of detail because I really did just 
say everything from my heart in that video, but I'll keep it short and sweet and say that this manga is mind blowing. It is everything that I've ever wanted to read in a manga. It's so unforgiving, unassuming, it's bleak, it's dark, it's depressing, it's morbid, it's grotesque, it's twisted, it's cruel, and it's unafraid to just plunge into the depths of the human psyche and to really unravel and dissect these intense, intricate, complex feelings that we have for each other, for ourselves, for society in general. It is such Oh, it's such a beautifully written piece of literature. And when I say I love everything about this manga, I really mean everything, like the story, the themes, the tone, the art style, the conflict, the dialogue, everything. It's just so gritty and realistic. It's the most realistic manga I've read so far. And I mean, I haven't read a lot to be fair, but out of the stuff I've read so far, this is like, wow. Wow. And yeah, I don't really know what else to say other than if you want to know more about how I feel, do check out that current favorites video or just read it for yourself. But I do want to let you know that if you can't quite stomach depressing material, then I wouldn't recommend you read this just yet. My favorite quote. I have a ton. Seriously. Okay. But this is my all time fave. I want to make your life miserable. And here we are, this is the end of the video. Those were my eight books that have changed my life, that have made a profound impact on my life. What do you think? Have you read any of these books? Are these books gonna end up on your TBR? Let me know. What books changed your life? Do let me know in the comments below because I would love some book suggestions, not that my TBR list is long at all. Um, it's ridiculously long and I don't think I'll ever catch up to reading every single book in my lifetime, but I can try, right? <laughs> Anyways, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for all the love and support you give to this channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that notification bell because it does help my channel so much. And yeah, thank you. And I will see you in the next one. Bye.